You'll notice as the panelists take their, their chairs that there is one chair missing. And uh, you'll find out why in a moment when my friend Kimberly Kelly uh, comes and reads a statement. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce these people to you. And just as my friends, and then I'll let them give a brief personal statement. We are running low on time, so brief personal statement, and then we'll get right to the questions that we've prepared for them. And then as you'll, if you'll pass your questions in to the left over here, Bill and Joel will collect them from you. So just pass your questions across if you have questions to submit. We'll try to find one or two and, and time for one or two um, at the end for Matthew. All right, thank you. Uh, to my right, all the way over here is my, my good friend Jerusha Armfield. Thank you, Jerusha, for being here tonight. <laughs> and next to Jerusha will be Jim Fox. And this is Rachel Sherwin, Christopher Parker, and of course Matthew Vines. Alright. Um Jeffrey and I have compiled some questions um, basically based on things that you guys were asking Jeffrey and myself and so we've compiled some questions and hopefully the questions I'm asking them are also representing the thoughts and concerns that you guys have as well. Um, my first one is for Rachel. Um, you've mentioned that when you disclosed your sexual orientation to a counselor at Bob Jones University, you underwent counseling to change your orientation. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about that as well as what um, your thoughts were when you read Matthew's book? Um, when I was a, at Bob Jones University, I did, because homosexuality, homosexuality had always been presented to me as a sin, I, when I realized that I was gay, I wanted to fix it because I wanted to be a good Christian. So the first, the first angle they took with me was, oh, well, you're just not spiritual enough, so let's get you right with God. Let's just get you spiritual enough so that you won't be gay anymore. Well, when they realized that, at least at that time in my life, there was nobody, <laughs> nobody who knew me well could say that I didn't love God and that I didn't want 110% what God wanted for me, whatever that meant. And I was willing to go to great lengths to try to be straight because that's what I thought God wanted for me. So when they realized that you're not spiritual enough, Angle wasn't working with me, they started, they did a lot of things like try to help me be more feminine because I mean, obviously I'm not a terribly feminine girl. Um, so everything from get rid of all your, your clothes that looks like men's clothes, paint your nails, wear makeup, this will make you straight. That was highly ineffective. Um, Besides just making me uncomfortable with my own appearance, it also made me feel like that's all that it means to be a woman, is that you paint your nails and you wear makeup, and if you're those things, then God loves you more than if you're, you know, more of a tomboy or whatever. Um, another approach they took to, um, was isolating me from all my female friends. Well, obviously, if you're close to females, then you're going to end up having a relationship with them, and God's not okay with that, so just stop having female friends, or, you know, don't let them give you hugs, don't be close to people, don't don't let people in like that because you'll obviously cross that line. Um, there, <laughs> there's so many things that we that, that happened in counseling that I'm it, too much to share. But um, all of it was just honestly resulted in me hating myself more and more. I could I couldn't look at myself in the mirror because everything that I was inherently, everything that I knew myself to be, was opposite of what they were saying God wanted for me, and it made me depressed and angry and suicidal and. It didn't change me. I'm still not straight. So um, that was my experience. When I read Matthew's book, um, it came as a shock to me. Um, so many books were given to me while I was in counseling. Um, so many books, stacks upon stacks of books were given to me to read, and nothing, nothing that dared to um, challenge all the basic assumptions that I had always been given about what the Bible says about homosexuality. I felt like people that believed the Bible couldn't possibly like who really truly believe the, the Bible the way um, uh, Matthew and people like him believe it. Um, I didn't feel like there was any way they could ever accept people like me. Um, I felt like God must hate us. Um, but reading his book definitely gave me hope that there is a place in Christianity for people like me. Thank you. Christopher, the next one is for you. 
Um, you've been a student at two upstate university, yes. I mean, two upstate Christian universities. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of being um, one, a person of color as well as a gay person? Um, and also, like Rachel did, what your experience and feelings were after reading Matthew's book? Uh, yes, um, I officially moved to Greenville about four years ago, but before that I was in college. Ooh, that's a long time ago. <laughs> I went to Bob Jones for about a semester. Um, the reason of leaving, my mom said I was too stubborn to follow their rules, so she's like, let's just go ahead and save the money and just say bye. Um, <laughs> but I did end up going to Anderson University, which is a Southern Baptist school, um, and they're a little more loose on their beliefs. Um, it wasn't talked about. It's just, it wasn't a thing that we wanted to talk about. Um, but I guess starting with being a person of color, um, I went to school for accounting. I was the only African American in the business program at that school. Um, I went there and like the first day that I got there, um, my professor asked me, he said, are you sure you're in the right class? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of the struggle that I went through. Um, I graduated early, I graduated in three years there, but um, that was kind of the struggle of being a person of color, um, really having to fight for your rights um, there and even outside of college you know there's a lot of battles of well you're a person of color so you're I've been told this in a recent interview about a few months ago that because I'm a person of color I was only meant to do certain things like wash their office not, not wash but clean their office and that kind of stuff but that's just kind of brief of that um as far as being gay um I didn't really come to terms with it until after college um it was something that I fought. Um, I went through depression for about three years. I um, tried to commit suicide twice um, while in college because it wasn't, I did not want to be this person um, who was gay. Um, so that was a big struggle of mine. Um, for a while I didn't act on it, I didn't think about it. Um, and about the last time that I did try to commit suicide, I kind of had to take back for a second and say, this is who I am, I have to accept it. Um, came out in 2012, um, right after I graduated, to my parents. Um, my mom didn't take it well. I got kicked out of the house. So I kind of went through a struggle of basically being homeless for a few weeks and kind of going place to place. Um, so that was the struggle with that. Um, as far as the school, I went to go for help, um, talk to them about it, and they just, they said it's something they couldn't touch on. They wouldn't help at all. Um, so that was kind of the struggle with that. But now I'm happy. <laughs> My parents, we've never, I can't believe I can say this now, but we're so close, um, which is amazing. Uh, we've come a long way. But that's where, that's kind of where I went. Um, just growing up trying to accept it and going through the depression and the suicidal thoughts and trying to commit suicide. And this is who I am, um, and I'm happy with that. Um, and after reading Matthew's book, which was wonderful, um, it was very, you know, you still have questions when you do a sept. Um, and it was kind of nice to read something that really took the scripture and dissected it. And I came to terms and I really enjoyed what Matthew had to say. Um, and to say that it's our right to be gay and a Christian. Um, and I grew up believing that if you have God as a friend and you can talk to him, it's okay because we didn't choose to be this way. And if I want to be this way and I want to be Christian, like, so darn it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, my next question is for you. It's kind of a two-fold question. Um, I'll hand you this when I'm done. Um, you are a Christian, you are straight, and you are a licensed therapist. Um, after reading Matthew's book, what kind of framework did this give you for counseling somebody in the LGBT community? That's the first question. The second question is, um, which a lot of you might be familiar with, um, Bob Jones recently hired Grace to conduct and review um, their counseling methods with respect to sexual abuse as well as sexual assault survivors. Um, Grace identified some flaws with their neuthetic or biblical counseling approach in the situation. Looking into that, do you see any similar issues with the approach that they had in counseling LGBT students? How much time do we have? I know, it's a very loaded question. <laughs> I just want to say I'm 
really thankful to be here. I think it's great that we're able to have a dialogue together. We represent so many different perspectives on uh, spirituality, on sexual behavior, sexual orientation. So just, it's really an honor to be here with everybody. Uh, first question was going to framework uh, did Matthew's book uh, suggest to me in dealing with clients. I think probably the biggest thing that the book did for me was it, it, I already knew this, but it, it, it reinforced it and underscored it for me that the principal thing in the Christian walk, and I, I, by your raising your hands, a lot of Christians here in the audience, the essence of the gospel, vicarious atonement, uh, Jesus' sacrifice for us, our need for mercy and grace, the essence of the gospel is not threatened by sexual behavior. The essence of the gospel is widespread. It's very broad and it covers everything under grace because Jesus took all of our shortcomings, uh, all of the things that we maybe can't figure out. Uh, the gospel still stands. And whether we're gay, straight, bisexual, LGBT, anything, anything that's represented here in the room is covered by the gospel. And so I think that's one of the reasons that we're able to sit together with, with, with everybody that's around here is that a lot of us share a very common trust, and that is in Jesus' sacrifice and grace for us. A little bit, uh, a little bit further, I think the book teaches us that in order to be gay, you don't have to necessarily chuck your faith. And I think a lot of times, uh, gay folks, they've, as, as, as Rachel and Christopher have talked about, they've just, they, they've tried so hard to be straight, to change their orientation, and gotten so frustrated uh, with that process, and, and at, at a point suicidal even, hopeless, um, whatever your position is here, again, the gospel covers it all, and you don't have to necessarily check your faith to have a dialogue on this topic. What was the second question again? There's a reference to grace and their counseling tactics with um, the abused, okay. and if you saw any of the same issues in their tactics with the LGBT community. Okay. Um, in, in regard to biblical or nuthetic counseling, I, 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 I'm a licensed therapist. Uh, it's, I'm not a nuthetic counselor or a biblical counselor necessarily. Uh, I don't identify myself uh, that way. Um, the essence of nuthetic counseling, and kind of going back to the, the Greek word from which nuthetic comes, uh, it means to admonish or to strongly confront. And I think sometimes where biblical counseling can be ineffective or sometimes even counterproductive is when it approaches people who are extremely wounded, who are really beat up. They've tried and tried and tried. They can't try any harder than they already have. And then to come to that person admonishing and strongly confronting, that just doesn't feel like a helpful approach to me. I, I, my approach is more, let's figure out what's going on. I'm here with you. We're going to walk together. Uh, you've obviously tried very hard, and you're to be commended for that. Um, another difference between nuthetic counselors and what I do as a licensed therapist is our, uh, our training track and our, our focus. By admission, uh, nuthetic counselors are interested in conformity to what they feel the scriptures teach us concerning our Christian walk. Um, whereas professional counseling is more uh, trying to help people develop, help people grow. It's more symptom focused. It's how can we help you get through this? What kind of skills can we give you? 
And uh, not to say that there's no place for biblical counseling, I think there is, but not to the exclusion of some of the other things that are really important for people, especially teenagers and young adults who are just trying to figure out who they are and, and what it means to be in the world. Uh, I think they, meet, they, they need uh, sometimes a softer tone. right down here. Um, my name is Kimberly Kelly. Um, I, I left the world of news in search of uh, ditching sound bites for conversation. So I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you uh, having a conversation. But my purpose here today is to read a statement for that empty chair that you see up there. Um, We're going to say that this statement comes from William. The person's name is not William. It is a true statement, however. Greetings, my name is William. I am a native of Greenville, South Carolina, and I have lived here all my life. I am a transgender. That's the chair you don't see filled here today. Something that I initially struggled against for most of my life until just a few years ago. The reason for that is that I was born and raised in a conservative local church and into a very conservative Christian family. I was taught my entire childhood and young adulthood that God would oppose to being gay or transgender and that the Bible and the church taught that it was a sin. I struggled desperately to rid myself of this as though if I tried hard enough, as we've heard from, from others, uh, prayed hard enough, trusted God hard enough, that I would somehow be saved from being a transgender. Of course, being gay or transgender is not something that you must trust God to save you from because it is not a sin. It is simply a variation of his incredible, complex, glorious creation. In the end, God did not save me from being transgender. Instead, he delivered me from destroying myself because I initially believed the misinformation that I had been taught my whole life, that he also saved my faith, that I am his forever as a Christian and not lost to despair because of the hatred and misjudgment of the system I grew up in. I found a church that accepted me as God does. I have found a community of brothers and sisters in Christ who accept me as he created me. However, I still live in a larger community in which I do not feel safe because of the rampant transphobia, hatred, and ignorance. I avoid my former church and even some family members because they still do not understand that God has created all of us as we are, and yet people in the congregation that I grew up in are still my family. And part of my heart forever, it is a painful, heartbreaking situation. And this is why tonight, you look at an empty chair, because I live in fear of the misjudgment, sometimes hatred, and possible danger as a transgender person here in my own hometown. And with great pain, I finally decided it was safer still to stay away at this time. I pray with all my heart, and those of you here will listen with open hearts and minds to what Matthew Vines has to say and teach tonight, because God is calling us all to see more clearly, to, be, to have better understanding of his word and a greater communion of spirit. Those of us who have been cast out needlessly from their communities due to misunderstanding, misjudgment, and injustice wish to come home. from the audience. Um, Matthew, I'm going to address this one to you, although um, having not 
been raised in the South, having not even um, visited our state until this evening. Um, it might be difficult, but I think the concept will be the same. Um, I'm a local here in the upstate, and it seems that there are many religious people who not only want to deny the LGBT community equal rights, but also would readily admit that we deserve to die. How do we as a community best begin to reconcile the notion of an actual loving church juxtaposed to all the hatred we see and experience here on a daily basis? That is a, uh, is this on? No. Okay, is it on now? No? Oh, no, it's on. All right, so the basic question is how to find a loving church in the midst of what feels like so much hostility. How to even believe that that is a reality, that there is a loving church in the area despite all of the hate um, that they've been experiencing from the religious community. I mean, it's very, it can be very hard depending on where you're from. And what I would like to be able to tell people, and what is sometimes true, is whenever anybody is struggling um, with their faith or distortions of their faith, I always want to be able to tell people to go back and to read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And I feel like that's where so many of us found the anchors and the foundations of our faith is in the person of Jesus. We read about in those texts, the problem is that when part of the reason, or a huge part of the reason, you feel so ostracized is because you are, you have been on the receiving end of the Bible as a weapon. And oftentimes, you can't even touch the Bible without it feeling toxic, or without it, in, without it bringing up all of these horrible memories. And so you can't even read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you can't even <coughs> rediscover the Jesus you once met in those pages. So that's what I, I think my main call would not be how do people, who, LGBT people who are struggling believe in something, but it's rather to everyone who is still part of a church, how do you make that believable? And what do you do in your church to change it? I was speaking um, actually just last night at a church in Nashville and there was a trans woman who spoke and she shared in the quest in the Q&A session and she shared that her uh, parents when she came out as trans told her that they would rather that she had died because then they would have a son instead of a trans daughter and she has been on the she has received she has been so horribly abused by church after church and she keeps going back to churches, which is the most remarkable kind of perseverance that so many straight Christians have never even had to think about whether or not they could do that. Never had to think about it. And so when there are people who, the fact that if you're know, if you treating this issue as primarily an abstract conversation, be it political, be it abstract theological, and you are actively working in your community to be changing the culture to the point where you can feel confident that a trans person, or a gay person, or a bisexual person, or anyone who is clearly different when it comes to their gender or sexuality, and if you don't feel confident that they can step into your church and that they will not hear words of scorn or condemnation, then I want you to ask yourself, what can you do to change that? Because that is radically inconsistent with the spirit and the message of Jesus, who we all want to be proclaiming. Uh, and so as, you know, for those who are wanting to hold on to belief, I just want especially straight Christians who are allies or thinking about trying to be allies or maybe who don't even agree with my final conclusions on this, but who also think that the status quo is unjust and is not something that they would ever want to accept for themselves or anyone they love. What can you do to actually be a voice for love and compassion in your church. Oh, and then I just also want to ask, did that, did the sign-up sheet get passed, did, did it stop anywhere? Is there anyone who didn't get the sign-up sheet? Okay, this side of the room, if we could work on that, because that is what a lot of the Reformation Project we're working to do, is to help people become better allies and to be more vocal at the conference that we're doing in Atlanta this June 11th through the 13th. Like, that's a, a big part of what we're focusing on, but it's, 
I mean, it's very hard. It can be so hard for people. And I also just want to express a lot of empathy for people who feel like they can't believe anymore because people deserve so much better from their churches. And if they're struggling with their faith for that reason, I feel like that is not only totally understandable, um, but that's also not something that they should feel any shame about. And it's really something that the church should feel a sense of conviction about changing. Thanks, Mikey. Um, I have one more question from the audience that I'm also going to address to you, Matthew. Um, I think the answer is probably going to be a little bit dependent on the community that each individual is in. But it says, which do you think helps people change their minds and ideas about LGBT acceptance? Scripture interpretation? Christian, gay, coming out to their congregation, but also demonstrating their love and compassion, or is there something else that you've... Uh, both and to that. Uh, just in my life, for my dad, me coming out to my dad is what changed my dad's heart. He was much more willing to learn and to grow, but that is not what changed my dad's mind. Me coming out, right, so uh, that created the context for us to study scripture together. And it was through coming to what he felt confident in, in terms of his understanding, coming to a different understanding of these main scripture passages that then allowed him to change his mind. And there are always exceptions to that. Some people, you know, it's gonna be more relationship, some more scripture, but I think for so many people, there's a critical combination of that. And so that's why I'm focused sort of laser-like on scripture, not because that is the only part of this conversation that is important, but it's because it's been a part of the conversation we have not been as equipped to have effectively, and so I'm wanting to help equip people to do that better. Tom? All right. Jeffrey's telling us that we have time it does not mean that we did not have lots more questions to ask and discuss, but we've gotten the discussion started.